principles in the treatment of fractures without fixation. Just pulled this book from the dusty shelves of my library. Huge shout out to Sir John Charnley for sharing such incredible educational insights. I'm beyond grateful to him and his family for preserving this knowledge in writing. This video has been produced a book source. We would like to thank editor John Charnley. Books has intrinsic value when physically held. Hence, anyone interested may purchase the book. The reference is provided below. Citation, Charnley J. The Closed Treatment of Common Fractures. Fourth ed. Cambridge University Press, 2003. Old texts and classical knowledge occasionally illuminate contemporary issues. Understanding the historical context of fracture treatment is essential. Not all fractures necessitate surgical intervention, nor may we be able to perform surgery on every patient. Comorbidities and age may exclude surgical intervention. Occasionally, the present day is illuminated by ancient literature and classical information. In fracture treatment, it is crucial to have knowledge of the past. Not all fractures necessitate surgery, and we may not be able to perform surgery on every patient. Age and secondary diseases may render surgery unfeasible. The treatment of fractures without rigid external fixation is no new idea. The method was advocated many years ago by the French surgeon Lucas Championnier, who described in elaborate detail a system of massage for each fracture and dislocation. Many of the reasons why the method could never be popular are economic. Thus, it would require an enormous personnel to administer it to an industrial region, and a large number of hospital beds would be required whereas plaster fixation renders domiciliary treatment possible. At the present time, the treatment of minor fractures without splintage tends to receive insufficient publicity, though most surgeons instinctively practice it when the occasion arises, and interest is aroused only when major fractures, such as those of the os calces or the spine, are treated by early movement. Yet it is in the common, minor fracture that the advantages of abandoning external fixation are most of. In the following paragraphs, an attempt is made to indicate what type of fracture can be treated without plaster fixation and what general principles might guide the surgeon in choosing this treatment. But before this can be done, it is first necessary to expose certain popular misconceptions regarding plaster fixation. 1. That the fragments of a fresh fracture are always mobile unless fixed by artificial means. 2. That a plaster cast will prevent such mobility. 3. That displacement will increase if the limb is not splinted. 6. That plaster fixation accelerates fracture healing. Ah that the quality of the end result will be better after treatment with plaster than without. When we attempt actively to elevate, without splintage, an extremity which contains a fractured long bone, movement at the fracture is produced by the weight of the distal limb acting through the leverage offered by the long fragments. In fractures involving the short bones, the length of the levers and the weight of the distal limb are both small and, unless muscular contractions generate an indirect force, there is practically no strain imposed on such fractures during gentle and restricted movements of the associated joints. Relative to their length, the short bones are of large diameter, which renders them mechanically stable when fractured, whereas the long bones, being narrow in comparison with their length, 
are exceedingly unstable when fractured. In fractures through cancellous bone, impaction is common, and this offers one obvious explanation of the absence of movement at a fracture when the whole limb is moved. In the long bones, impaction is impossible because both fragments are of ivory bone, a fact which students often seem to overlook. But impaction of an ivory shaft can take place into the cancellous extremity of a long bone, as is commonly seen in the calls fracture and less commonly in necks of the femur and humerus. In the miniature long bone, the metacarpals and metatarsals isolated. Fractures are splinted by the adjacent bones through the strong interosseous ligaments which bind them together. Fractures of cancellous and cortical bone differ considerably in their rate of healing. Whereas a fracture in the shaft of a long bone may be mobile for six weeks, because of the great leverage on the fracture site and scanty callus, a fracture in cancellous bone may be clinically firm in this time, though it would of course be unfit to bear weight until true consolidation had occurred. In recent fractures, it seems reasonable to interpret pain on the movement of adjacent joints as a sign that the fracture is being disturbed that the pain in a recent fracture does in fact come from the fracture itself is shown by the absence of pain when local anesthesia is introduced into a fracture therefore it can be considered as an axiom that in a recent fracture as long as a range of movement is possible in neighboring joints without evoking pain in a healing fracture. No significant movement is taking place at the fracture site. Significant movement at a fresh fracture is threatened only when the painless range is exceeded. Thanks for watching. Orthopedics Trauma in YouTube.